I'm Miriam from Fun FTC, and I'm here with Team 19234 Bite Force from Romania. We are here at the Maryland Tech Invitational, and they had a great performance this weekend. And now let's dive into some of the unique features of their robot. This video on fun was brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Studica Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. All right, so let's just start out with like your, like the base of your drivetrain. So like I know you all have like so many features like it looks like very like compact like you have a lot going on so can you just walk me through it okay so at the beginning uh, the beginning of the season we used to have a butterfly drivetrain and our robot was kind of uh, built around that but right now uh, we took it off uh, just, just just to have uh, uh, a robot that's a bit more more agile for this competition. Uh, however, one thing to note is that we uh, made sure that we uh, placed our uh, odometry pods uh, right at the center of the robot. They are all, all in line. And also, uh, one thing that we wanted to implement uh, was uh, to make sure that our gyroscope was also uh, uh, at the center, uh, which is right here on, under our transfer. Um, we also uh, took advantage of the uh, width that our uh, uh, butterfly uh, needed to have in order to function uh, and uh, because of that we had the space to uh, add like uh, seven stages of uh, Misumi sliders. Great, and so now that we've talked about like all those like different like you know the, the odometry pods, the gyro, like can you just tell me about like some of like the ways that you use those sensors maybe in the autonomous period? Uh, yeah, so in the autonomous period, we do use both the odometry and the gyroscope to really uh, know the exact position of the robot at all times. However, there are a few other additions to this. First of all, we also use the April tags on the field to be able to localize using this camera up front, a Logitech C920, to detect them and use them to find out the XY pose of the robot on the field not using the heading, we have the gyroscope for that. We also don't pull the gyroscope every single cycle, we only pull it about four times a second because the odometry heading drift isn't that large and we need to save some loop times because ITC calls are very expensive. And to fuse all of this data together in a manner that's uh, pretty sophisticated but also really helpful for really giving insight into how precise the approximation is, we use an extended Kalman filter. It uses various matrices for the estimates and for some uh, covariances, which are numbers which basically say how accurate something is meant to be. Uh, to really be able to tell the exact pose of the robot at all times. And a modification we added to that is the camera readings, which are a bit in the past because the pipelines do take a while. So we roll back the last part of the comma filter executed, which is a stack-like uh, data structure. We insert the camera uh, reading right there, and then we reanalyze the measurements up to the present to get an even more precise. Uh, Great, and so, so like how many, how, like how long did it take you to get that, all of that like, you know, like common, common filter and all of everything else like tuned properly? Like uh, to actually develop the common filter, it took a while in order to make it more robust and allow the possibility of adding any more measurements or control variables if needed. It took about a week, maybe two. Uh, in order to tune it, tuning it is pretty much done empirically in order to further suit our needs as much. And we also had to add some sanity checks, like if the April tag readings are very far off, the heading makes absolutely no sense, and the corrections are really big, then we say that this measurement is not okay so that we don't uh, mess up the rest of the column further. So now it works really well. Great, and so now let's jump back into your robot's hardware. So you showed us the, your extension earlier, so can you talk more about that? Yes, so we implemented this extension mainly uh, so as to um, so as to drive as little as, as possible uh, during the autonomous period, so we don't uh, collect any uh, errors, along, errors along the way. Um, one thing to note is that 
uh, we we didn't want to implement uh, a scissor for our um, for our cable management here, uh, so we actually used uh, some uh, nylon filament or some, some something close to that, like three millimeters in diameter, so that we have uh, this sort of uh, telephone wire like uh, cable extension, uh, and that helped uh, save some weight. Uh, but also one thing that we needed to implement for this extension was our transfer, which has some automations also. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about the intake that feeds into the transfer? Okay, so um, first of all, um, we chose um, uh, sprockets uh, for our intake because uh, we didn't want to be constrained uh, by the length of the of different belts. Um, we also made it consistent by um, using recalc uh, in order to evaluate the speed of the pixel. Um, and we uh, noticed that uh, just um, just by using the first stage of uh, the um, surgical tubing, uh, the, uh, the pixel is uh, able to get uh, somewhere near the location of the transfer. So uh, the other uh, stage is just to control the pixel, not actually propel it uh, towards uh, the um, transfer location. Great. And then can you tell me, like, so you mentioned that you like measure the speed of the pixel. So what kinds of sensors are, invo are required for that? Um, we uh, evaluated, um, well, uh, not, uh, we didn't evaluate it by uh, using um, sensors. We just uh, found out some parameters and we uh, entered them and we got out uh, an approximate speed uh, of the pixel. So we just calculated it by uh, using distance and uh, time, an approximate time. Nice. And so now can you tell me a little bit about once the pixels are in the transfer, um, how does it get into your outtake mechanism? So first of all, uh, our transfer first uh, detects with using these two brake beams here that we have uh, for each of the pixels. Uh, they detect when uh, the two pixels are in our transfer. transfer. And when that happens, our um, extension retracts and it goes under our outtake here. And uh, our outtake uses uh, these uh, over center locking linkage uh, claws uh, that <clears throat> grab under the pixels and then uh, they lock into position so that we don't have to uh, keep our uh, servo servos in tension while we hold them. Um, and then uh, we can place them on the table uh, in pretty much any way we want uh, because, oh, sorry. Okay, in pretty much any way we want because we have, uh, I, be, I think, about four degrees of freedom here. Uh, and we also implemented uh, a suspension mechanism in order to allow us uh, to have uh, as much of a uh, room for error as possible in Teleop especially. Great. And so now, now can you tell me a little bit about uh, how you launch your drone in Endgame? Uh, yes, sure. So we use uh, this launcher, uh, which we've um, made a bit a bit wider uh, in order to be able to fit a uh, thicker plane uh, because we found out that um, it's it's more reliable if we uh, count on the mass um, mass of the plane instead of its aerodynamics so uh, the plane right now uh, is uh, mainly uh, being launched at this angle uh, because we've also implemented um, uh, this system that allows us to adjust the angle uh, just based on the drone. So if we have a drone that uh, doesn't uh, go the same same length as another, we just uh, adjust the uh, angle of it. Uh, and we also use surgical for this uh, launching mechanism. Yeah. And how many different drone designs did you go through throughout the season? Uh, I think about four, but uh, the, this most recent uh, drone design has uh, been with us since like regionals. We've just made it uh, thicker for MTI because uh, just uh, as I said, we want to count more on its mass than its uh, aerodynamic. Can you please tell me a little bit about how you hang on the rigging in Endgame? Oh yeah, sure. So because we had to use uh, so many uh, motors for our other uh, other systems, such as our ext extension that uses actually two instead of one, uh, our linear extension, I mean, um, we had to design some sort of um, passive mechanism because we didn't want to slow down our um, our vertical extension too much. So we have this uh, reverse virtual, 
double reverse uh, four bar uh, here that we uh, used to uh, get those hooks up and then uh, we just um, launch ourselves into the, the truss and the truss uh, goes under our hooks. And we also use our extension in order to uh, balance our, our uh, robot out afterwards. Great, well, that is really cool. So uh, thank you so much for your time, Bite Force. And really, like, this is like an um, incredible robot, you know. You, you've gotten to MTI, like, you know, very competitive competition, you know, you're from Romania, which is, you know, also a very competitive region. So thank you so much for your time and good luck in any future competitions and seasons. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Studica Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots.